you back. I know you have heard some great preaching over the last few weeks, and so uh, you may not be glad that I'm back, but you guys are my family, so I am thankful to be home. By the way, VBS tomorrow, I'm, oh, actually it starts tonight, so excited. Do you know that 270 of you are volunteering this week? That's extraordinary. I mean, you have no idea how big of a deal that is. I am with pastors all the time that are looking for volunteers for this and that, and I've heard Loretta for the last two weeks say, we don't need any more volunteers. Now, that's not to say if you don't have some time on your hands, come on up. I'm sure we could plug you in somewhere, but 207 of you, thank you very much. What an incredible incredible church this is to serve in the way that you do. So thank you very, very much. We are back in the book of Romans for the next few weeks. Then we're going to do a study on the Song of Solomon, and I cannot wait. I hope you can't wait either. Some of you may feel a little bit worried about what could happen during a series on the Song of Solomon. And listen, it's in the Word of God. It is obvious that God would not have left it in the canon if he didn't want us to study it. And what better place to study about marriage, relationships, and some of the other things that we won't talk about because of our esteemed uh, children that are in here this morning. What better place to talk about that than the church and to have right understanding about that. So, you don't want to miss that. That will start in July. Well, as a reminder, as we go back and remember why the book of Romans was written, what we know is that it was written to the church to make sure that we understand the power and preeminence of the gospel. Now, in chapter 1, Paul talks about what the gospel is. He says, one, it is the power of God. He doesn't say that it brings power, it has power, we know that that's true, but that it is power, that we have the presence and power of God in us, the power and presence of God that spoke the world into existence, that parted the Red Sea, that flooded the earth, that heals the sick, that raises the dead, that has dominion over death, Satan, and pain and hurt. Pretty amazing. And he says that this power, the gospel, is the power unto salvation for those who believe. So this power does what no other power in the world does, is that it reconciles us, it saves us, and it promises us a place in eternity with Jesus. Now it also says that the gospel is not only the power of God, but it is God's righteousness revealed. So the gospel not only saves us, but it keeps us, which essentially means that it helps us understand who we are in Christ. It helps us understand how we are to see ourselves in light of who Jesus is and what he has done for you and me. For example, when you're trying to kick a habit or you have an addiction and you keep sabotaging yourself and all you can hear go through your head is the word failure. That's when we go back to the gospel because the gospel reminds us that we're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. It's when you start looking in the mirror because you want to get poolside ready, Right? It's summertime, you want to look good, you start looking in the mirror, things don't seem to be fitting the right way, you're wondering why this part of your body is here now when it used to be somewhere else or non-existent, and you just feel maybe a little bit shamed. That's when we go back to the gospel, and we're reminded that Jesus looks at us as intrinsically valuable and good and beautiful, right? Right? Well, this morning we're going to talk about how the gospel speaks into suffering. How the gospel speaks into suffering. That the gospel essentially provides for us a hope that is unlike anything else that we know of in the world. Now, I know it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, man, I, I am grateful that I had a great father. One of the things my father taught me was how to handle loss. Now, he didn't teach me how to lose, but he taught me how to handle loss. Now, early on, that was pretty simple. You know, maybe I didn't get a part in a play. Maybe I didn't get first chair with tuba. I know. <laughs> maybe I lost a game, football, basketball. But then he began to teach me as we lost family members what it looked like to handle loss and suffering well. 
In high school, when I lost my best friend at age 16, suddenly he died. He helped me understand what it looks like to handle loss there. Now, I don't always handle loss well now, but I can't imagine how I would handle it if I didn't have that godly leadership in my life. And I'm thankful that my father had a gospel understanding of what it looks like to experience loss and suffering in light of the gospel. See, today we live in a world, we live in a culture where everybody is taught that they're a winner, right? You love this? You like going to field days these days? Where for showing up and participation, you get a blue ribbon. That we live in a culture where people feel like they're entitled to certain things. Whether that be just because they showed up, or maybe it's because they're an American, or you fill in the blank. But what happens is when reality hits, and it does, and we find out that not everybody wins all the time, and that we are going to lose something or someone dear to us, or there's some type of unforeseen crisis that takes place in our life. Our culture doesn't know what to do. They don't know how to handle loss. They don't know how to handle suffering. And, and reality is, is no amount of money, power, or even planning can prevent death, illness, betrayal, financial disaster, and a whole host of other troubles that eventually will come our way. You know, in fact, I think one of the main reasons that people have a hard time believing in God is because they don't know what to do with the loss and trouble and suffering that they see, but also that they experience in life. Whether that is just everyday tragedy, whether that is unspeakable pains, whether that is abuse, whether that is surprising deaths or unjust events, People don't know what to do with that. In fact, most people that I hear who call themselves atheists or agnostics or they, they eventually turn to science, it's, I, I never hear them talk about it because they view those alternatives as better. But they don't know what to do with suffering and loss. They don't know how to reconcile that. And yet this is a major problem then, because suffering is transcendent. It knows no class, race, culture, or prestige. And the route is, is if you haven't experienced some type of suffering yet, you just haven't lived long enough, it, it will come. It will come. I mean, most of us know couples where a spouse has been unfaithful. Or we know of somebody who's been irresponsible and harmed others, or those that have experienced incredible hurt or abuse and and sometimes we even wonder, why does God allow these things to happen? Well, why did I lose my job? Why did I lose my child? Why is this unjust person being rewarded and I'm losing everything? Why? Why, why didn't God answer my prayer? For centuries, people have been asking this question. For centuries, the church has tried to be in the middle of this conversation. And so I hope this morning, in fact, I know this morning that Scripture speaks clearly to this. But one thing I do think is important to recognize is that sometimes in the middle of loss and adversity, people don't need an intellectual answer to a practical problem. Sometimes we don't have the answers of why. We don't have the reasons. The good news is, is that God does provide the resources to walk through that. And that's what Paul is talking about this morning. Like I said, I don't know that people always want philosophical answers to emotional and practical problems in their life. But what people are looking for or a group of people that know how to walk in the midst of their suffering well. That can still look to the hope of Jesus regardless of what they're experiencing. Because here's what we know, is that adversity or loss will either cause people 
to draw closer to the Lord or further away from the Lord. That, that crisis will either awaken people out of their self-sufficiency or drive them to become more self-sufficient. And this is why the church must wrestle with this. This is why we have to have some answers, not to the reasons, but to the hope in which we follow. That's why people need to see the church walking well in the midst of pain and suffering. I don't think it's a coincidence at all that the countries that are experiencing more persecution, more trouble, more hurt are the churches that are thriving. It is unbelievable when we hear about what is happening right now in Syria, Afghanistan, and Iran. Thousands upon thousands of people are coming to know Jesus every day. That's been happening in Africa for years. Did you know that there are almost more Christians in the country of China than just the total population of the United States now? Incredible. And I can assure you that one of the primary reasons this is happening is because non-believers see Christians suffer well. They see the hope that is in the glory of God even in the midst of their pain and hurt. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. You know, I, I think there's a couple ways that Satan loves to keep us in bondage. And one of those is, is pleasure and uh, prosperity. You know, he, he wants us to think that we have all we need so that God is irrelevant. In fact, you know, there's this thing that Satan created called the prosperity gospel, which makes God throw up in his mouth that, <laughs> honestly, I mean, it makes me want to cry to think about how divisive this is in our world because this idea is that if you do what is right, then God, uh, you can leverage that to get whatever you want from God. And it's so sickening, and there's so many people that believe in that mess. But the other way that Satan loves to keep us in bondage is through pain and suffering. He wants us to think that there's no good God that is worth trusting. And many people, many Christians believe that when they're experiencing pain and suffering that they did something wrong. And yet my hope this morning, what I think you're going to hear Paul talk about is that Oftentimes, pain and suffering comes to those who are obedient, not as a form of punishment or consequence, but because God can trust you. In fact, I would say oftentimes, hardship is a mark of obedient discipleship. Romans chapter 5, great passage. Here we go. Therefore, again, he had just talked about justification in chapter 4. He's going to talk about it again here in the first couple verses, and we'll talk about that together here in a second. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand presently. Good news. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Future, great news. Now, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Man, y'all miss a great opportunity. I gave you an opportunity to say amen. You completely passed it by. Amen. Okay. Verse 6. And Paul does something kind of unique here. He's actually authenticating his first five verses through, uh, by verses 6 through 21. So uh, 6 through 21 is just a great picture of the gospel, okay? So here, here's what he says. For while we were still weak at the right time, and God is never late, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. We know that to be true. Though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
There you go. You got it that time. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by His blood, that sacrifice, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Praise God for that. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, that's the piece he's talking about, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, verse 12, just as sin came into the world through one man, he's talking about Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come." But the free gift is not like the trespass. Trespass, kiddos, is just a fancy word for sin. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Man, y'all are starting to get the hang of this. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass, trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Amen. So that, purpose clause, as sin reigned in death, grace also, or result clause, yeah, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that is good, good news. So, let me talk about the first five verses for a second. He says, therefore, and begins to talk about justification. And he talks about it in three ways here in the first two verses. The first way uh, is this. He says, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace through God. So that idea of peace is not some subjective idea or feeling that, you know, I have peace. I feel content right now. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what, what he's describing in verses 9 and 10, being reconciled to God. It's a positional, objective type of peace. That our position, our status has changed. You may remember we've talked about uh, multiple times that being forgiven is a great thing, but it just makes us morally neutral. Okay? We need more than forgiveness. We need justification. We need more than just forgiveness, which is regeneration, but we need a judge that actually declares us righteous. That's what justification does, is that when we are justified, he puts his righteousness in us. He reconciles us. And by making us righteous, he then says you no longer have debt. That is the idea of justification. That is required for us to know a holy God, to be in relationship with a holy God. He has to see us as righteous, and he will only see us as righteous because of Jesus' righteous blood covering us. Okay, So he goes on. He says, and, and so that's how he deals with our past. See, this is beautiful because justification deals with our past, present, and even our future. We don't always think about that. We, we oftentimes just think about what it means for me right now. So he, he brings us peace, reconciliation, deals with our past. Then he goes on to say this. We have peace through God, uh, with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So presently, what justification brings is allows us to stand in the covering and grace of Jesus. Man, that is great news for us who continue to sin. We continue to need his grace. 
But he continues to go on from there, and he begins to talk about our future. He says, so through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So that our future is also secure. This hope that he's talking about is a conviction. Okay? It's not some wishful thinking. In fact, we're gonna, he, he's going to talk about this a little bit more that is based on a promise. So, he goes on to say, in verse 3, not only that, so, here's Paul saying, if justification wasn't already awesome, check this out. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, that's when most of us hit the brakes, right? And what, what, what's he talking about here? That we rejoice in our suffering. It doesn't say rejoice for suffering. He doesn't say, man, when suffering comes, you ought to just put on a smiley face and be excited about that. That's, that's, that's certainly not what he's, he's talking about. You know, there, there's no joy in our pain and trouble. But what he is saying is that there is joy in what Jesus has done. There's joy in the hope that he provides, that this is not all that there is. There's hope in the resources that he provides. It also reminds us that when somebody else is going through pain and hurt, we don't walk up to them and just go, man, count it all joy, brother. Let's try not to be insensitive like that, right? That's not what he's saying here. Rather, he's trying to address an attitude that he wants us to put on to begin to express, where we begin to understand that when we walk through trials and trouble, that God is still purposeful in that. That we can have his perspective. I love the Chinese character for the word crisis. Some of you heard me say this before, but it means dangerous opportunity. Dangerous opportunity. And what Paul is suggesting is that we embrace our trials not for what they are, but for what God would accomplish in and through them. The opportunities that may abound as a result of the crisis that hits. And here's what he says takes place. When suffering hits, it produces endurance. Endurance produces endurance. This idea of endurance is the idea of perseverance. It's the Greek word hypomone, which I wouldn't say it other than the fact that I love to say the word hypomone. I mean, it just kind of rolls off your tongue. Say it with me, hypomone. Man, look at your neighbor on your left and your right and say hypomone. Hypomone, that's right. And, and this idea of hypomone uh, gives a connotation that you have the ability to bear up under circumstances that produce pressure, that you can bear up under difficult circumstances. Now, I think endurance and perseverance is really important because when, when we start to persevere, it really helps us to focus on what really matters, right? Helps us to become single-minded. Suffering often does that. Again, it produces that endurance, that single-mindedness. Well, he goes on to say that not only does suffering produce endurance, but endurance produces character. It produces character. Now, this idea of character is the idea of being tested. It's the idea of being tested. Uh, think about it like this, military boot camp. I have not experienced that. I've heard about it. Uh, I know some of you have experienced that. And the intent of boot camp is to put pressure on you in such a way that when you are experiencing in the field trials and changes, that you have already been tested. You know how to respond. So he says that this endurance produces a testedness. It, it develops your character in the midst of trials and pain. Well, isn't that, isn't that important as people are watching us in the midst of our pain? That what they see is godly character? Well, he goes on to say, then character produces hope. 
And this is a really great hope. It says this is a hope that will not put us to shame. But because God has poured out his love on us and then essentially sealed that love with his Holy Spirit that he's put in us, that divinity lives in the child of God. That's a remarkable thought. But character produces hope. Now this hope is not wishful thinking. It's not like when we would say, you know, um, I hope the sushi restaurant is open today. You know? Or, you know, I hope that they have gluten-free vegan ice cream at Melt this week. Right? I never hoped that, by the way. I hope that for some of you, but I do not hope that for myself. But this is a hope that is based on conviction. It's based on a I think what Paul is trying to get at is, hey, you know, congregation, do you, do you know of those moments that you don't ever want to experience again, but you wouldn't trade for the world because what God did in, through you, and even for you, okay? So a few takeaways this morning, then we'll be done. First thing is this, and I'm going to start with verses 6 through 21. Paul kind of flips that. I'm going to flip it back. I'm not, uh, I don't have an issue with Paul flipping that. That's fine. But let me, let me start with verses 6 through 21 because it's a perfect picture of the gospel. And it really gives us the principal foundation of why suffering, not prosperity, but suffering is required for us to have hope in the midst of our suffering. And this God addresses suffering through the incarnation rather than through an explanation. Let me say that again. God addresses suffering through the incarnation rather than an explanation. In fact, he chooses to walk in suffering and address suffering by suffering himself. Incredible. I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, suffering is real pain in a temporary world. Suffering entered man. That's what it talks about through Adam. As a result, all of us are condemned because of Adam's sin. It created a brokenness that permeates the entire world. But God's response to suffering was sending himself, sending his son Jesus into suffering on our behalf. Amazing. In fact, you know, later on in, in, uh, in the New Testament, Paul uses this idea of childbirth to talk about the hope that comes through suffering, the pain that is involved in that, the process that is involved in that. But when the child is born, the joy, the hope, the newness, and, and that's the principle that we see here in verses 6 through 21. And that's, a, that's a foundational principle of the gospel that suffering and sacrifice is required. Essentially, death is required for there to be life. And so rather than us thinking about suffering in terms of punishment or consequence for us, we look to it as possibility. We look to it as, what does God want to accomplish in the midst of this? I mean, here's what I think that means, because we have the suffering servant, Jesus, is that he doesn't merely sympathize with us, you know, feel or acknowledge that we're going through pain, but he truly empathizes with us because he understands it first person. He has walked through that. He is our great mediator in that way. I think it's also true that when others attempt to harm us, God still accomplishes good in us, through us, and even for us. I think it's also true that sometimes we don't know that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. And sometimes he brings us to a point, a painful place, so that we recognize that he and he alone is all we need. Second thing is this. 
God's hope directs us to his resources instead of his reasons. God's hope directs us to his resources instead of his reasons. Now listen, there are a lot of reasons for suffering. A lot of reasons. I mean, some of it is self-inflicted choices. We know that. We don't have to look any further than Adam and Eve. Scripture talks about it right here, starting in verse 6. King David, Bathsheba, self-inflicted choices. But there's a number of others. Sometimes it's just to display the greatness of God, like the blind man in John chapter 6, or to deepen our faith, like our friend Job, to prepare us for heaven, Daniel, to increase our boldness, Stephen, to minister more effectively to people who are in pain and hurting as well. We saw that with Joseph. To reinforce our call to go into all the world, essentially suffering and pain, and the fact that we should expect that eliminates an excuse not to go to the ends of the earth. And oftentimes it's just to magnify the sufficiency that we have in Christ, which is where Paul is this morning. Uh, and I love what he says in verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I mean, this is unlike any other philosophy or religion. This is not a hope based on chance. It's a hope based on promise. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This is really good. In him, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of the glory of God. So essentially what he's saying is that as a result of the Holy Spirit being the guarantor, he is sealed, he is the guarantor of our inheritance, which means that we have all of the resources, in fact divinity lives in us, we have all of the resources to walk through this pain, hurt, trouble, trials that we need. And that's great news. <laughs> we have a God who is impossibly loving. He is always faithful, who loves us in our joy and in our pain, even in our darkest moments when we are crushed. He is as close to us as our own breath. And not only does he provide love, care, and grace, but he also created the church to provide that too. Which may not be clearly stated here, but it is implicit in what we're talking about. You know, not, not an hour ago, I was praying with a friend who two weeks ago found out that she has cancer. And in the morning, she has surgery. This is an incredible family. Faithful, loving I don't know why. They don't know why this is happening. But I do know that we have an opportunity as a church to love them, care for them, walk with them. There's dozens and hundreds of us in here that are going to walk through similar circumstances. And the church will be incredibly important in that. God uses the church to do that. And then lastly, in the midst of suffering and pain, look to what you'll gain rather than what you'll lose. Look to what you'll gain rather than what you'll lose. You know, when we look at what we lose, we oftentimes become tempted to change our situation by our own hands, right? So we don't like this, so we want to do something else. Listen, trials always bring temptation. Trials always bring temptation. Financial difficulty, we're tempted to distrust God and stop being generous. When somebody that we love or is close to us dies, we're tempted to question God's love. When we're experiencing suffering, you know, we're in an unjust way, we're tempted to doubt God's justice. We want to pass the buck. We want to blame others. We want to blame our upbringing, friends, family, government, condition, our own condition, environment. And yet knowing that Sin is still our responsibility to deal with. So rather than looking to what we'll lose, we look to what we'll gain. Paul was so clear about this when he talked about it in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 12. It'll be on the screen. And, and let me just read a portion of this for you. I mean, Paul had such an unbelievable outlook on this in the midst of his own suffering. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, So to keep me from becoming conceited, this is a good reason not to be narcissistic. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, there's all sorts of theories about what this thorn would be for Paul. I don't know that anybody is for sh you know, knows for sure what that is, but what we know is there was a physical ailment that he experienced on a regular basis, and he actually attributes that to God. So a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, this is Jesus saying to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says this, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. So here's, here's what I want you to know about looking to what you'll gain. See, Paul was able to look through his pain into the certainties of God. He was able to look through his pain into the power that is in the hope of the glory of God. He recognized that oftentimes God uses pain and trouble to help us release our hold from our own worldly desires and to grasp more tightly onto him. He also uses this to express his gospel to those around us. And I love the story that J. Oswald Sanders tells about um, uh, a guy who was going from village to village in India preaching the gospel. One a preacher pastor, he just, he, the gospel had transformed his life. And he's walking from village to village. He was exhausted. He was tired. He, he was discouraged. And he comes to a certain village, and he goes in, begins to share the gospel with them, and they turn him away, say, we don't want to hear anything about this. So after a full day of going village to village, he decides to go to the outskirts of the village, and he lays up against a tree. Tired, exhausted, he falls asleep. Well, when he wakes up, the entire village is standing around him. And the head of the village explains to this man, when we saw the scars on your feet, we knew you had something to say. We are sorry that we didn't listen. The whole village came to know the gospel. Now, oftentimes it is the scars in our life that give us a voice to share the gospel. It is the pain and the hurt. And when we walk in the hope of the glory of God, it often communicates the gospel in a way that we never could. And if you think about it for a moment, and it won't take you long to think about this, but isn't that exactly what the suffering servant Jesus did for you and me? Had the Son of Man came and said, here's the reason, without sacrifice, he still would have been worthy to worship, but would we have listened? But he came bearing the sin of the world on his back. Suffering a pain 
more excruciating than we could ever understand or imagine, not just because of the cross, but because of the weight of the world's sin. And as a result of his death, you and I can experience life. So what does this mean for you this morning? What is the action, perhaps, that needs to take place? You may not like hearing this, but I would imagine that some of our suffering and pain has created some bitterness in our heart. And we're just angry about it. And it may be that one of the first things we need to do is simply repent of that. And confess that God is still trustworthy and worth worshiping. Even in the midst of our suffering. It may be too that you have been seeking answers. And you just need to seek God. So how would you respond this morning? I ask that the worship team come back up here and as I pray and as our staff joins me at the front and there'll be others that would love to just pray with you, I'm going to ask that you respond however you need to this morning. It may be that you just need to pray with somebody. It may be that um, maybe that you just want to share uh, something with, with staff or another person that would pray with you. But would you respond however the Lord would have you? Father, thank you for modeling what it means to be a suffering servant by sending your son, Jesus. Father, would you help us to have your perspective on the hurt and trouble that many of us experience or that we will experience. Would you allow us to have your perspective and your attitude because of the transformation that you have done in our heart as a result of the gospel? Would you not allow our suffering, pain, and trouble to be excuses? But rather that we would see what you're accomplishing in and through and for us in those. In Jesus' name, amen.